Um, so I'm going to describe a subconvex bound for, for certain family valve functions on un cross un plus one uh, for general n. It's going to be in the pair depth aspect. Um, the proof is going to run by first using the Achino Ikeda formula, um, which is now a theorem of Bozart, Chassi, Shadow, and Zidor, um, to relate the central L value of this product L function to an automorphic period integral, and then to prove a bound for that automorphic period integral using the amplification method of Varnius and Sarnak. Um, and this is, this is a theorem whose write up has been long delayed um, for personal reasons and the pandemic, but I've, I'm working on it now and hope, you know, I'm hoping to have this finally written up in a month or two. Um, okay, so let me start by stating the theorems and then I'll talk about, so I'll say some more general things about the relations between um, L values, period integrals, and well, well, L values, period integrals, and harmonic analysis. Um, and that will kind of lead into discussing some of the ideas of the proof. Okay, so let's, let's introduce some notation. So we're going to be working with a CM extension of number fields, E over F. Um, v will be a permission space. With respect to the other F connection in plus one, the H in V will be a co dimension one subspace. And so associated to these two emission spaces, we have unitary groups, so G will be. Unitary group B and H will be the unitary group of the H. Um, so these two form a Gan Gross Brassard pair. So I'll, I'll take a family of automorphic representations on G cross H. The family is going to be essentially defined by a condition at a split finite place. Um, so I'll call this W, and this will be distinguished throughout the talk. So W will be a finite place if it splits in your graph. And I'll write P maximal ideal at W and Q or the order of residue. All right. Let's see if I can this space here. Okay, so here is the family we're going to consider. In fact, there's, there's going to be two families. Um, there's a family that's kind of convenient for stating the period bound, and then another family with two extra conditions, which is um, the one that the subconvex bound will hold for. Um, so this is the family that I'll state the period bound for. So if one is the family of automorphic representations of G cross H satisfying the following four conditions. So the first condition is that the level away from W is bounded. So at finite places away from W, everything's, everything's controlled. Um, oh, sorry, I need to give this the name. So I'll call this pi cross pi H, representation of G and a representation of H. Um, so first condition, I'm pi h bounded level away from w. 
Secondly, the fact is that infinity are fixed. So you can take them to be anything you like, just we're gonna we're gonna fix them. The third one is a um, temperedness condition. It's gonna make uh, it's gonna allow us to amplify. Um, so pi pi h. Sorry, so in two, you really want them fixed it's in a bounded. Well, in a, in a bounded, yeah, they don't. You have to have some compatibility between the Archimedean places and the signatures of the Riemann theory group. Um, actually, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I completely forgot one of these conditions. Uh, these unitary groups are going to be definite uh, at infinity. So the emission space. I mean, so, so uh, thank you for kind of indirectly jogging my memory about that. Um, the question of like exactly what emission, you know, local factors of emission spaces can be other, uh, other places I'm not going to get into. Um, but yes, so compact unitary groups, so the unitary, you know, discrete, so just, it makes sense to just fix, fix um, the infinity factors. Um, so the third condition is a temperedness, so pi and pi h theta tempered. At all places um, split in your breath with maybe finitely many exceptions. Um, and the first data template means instead of oh, just measure that the Satake parameters. Uh, Don't you have in these definite cases, maybe Ramanujan's already known, but anyway. Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. <laughs> Forgot about that. Um, yes. Anyway, that's a minor point. Yeah. So, so we can assume it's tempered. Yeah, that's true. Um, I had an older version of this talk where this wasn't, you don't need this to be a definite unitary group, but yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's proved. Uh, it depends on Arthur's work. So. <laughs> Some of these things depend on Arthur. Anyway, oh, really? okay. But, uh, just leave it in brackets. Uh, I'll just. Um, and then the last condition is that where the action happens. Um, so at W, both local factors are going to be principal series representations. So I'll denote this by pi of chi. So this is the induction from a Borel at W to GW of a character, I and mean, this, this is unitary induction. Um, of course, W is a split place, so this is just isomorphic to a Piet GLN. Um, so pi W is going to be a principal series, and likewise for factor of pi H. Um, so where chi and chi h are characters satisfying a certain condition, uh, which I will describe in a second. So where chi from fw cross n plus one, c cross and chi h, and w cross to the n to c cross, uh, something I call a generic pair of characters. And they have a conductor, a conductor e to the 2L. So last thing I need to do is tell you what this notion of a generic pair is.
perhaps we say, first of all, there's a condition on each character separately, chi and chi h. Um, so we say that chi from fw cross to n plus one to c cross is generic to L. Conductor of each. So let's write out the components. So chi one through chi n plus one are going to be the components of chi. And so for each of these component characters, I'll require that the conductor reaches less than e to the 2L. And if I take the ratio of any two of them, the conductor is exactly p to the 2L. And then we say that chi, chi H is a generic pair. Well, if chi and chi H are each generic individually. And all of the kind of all of the cross ratios have conductor P to two L. So chi of so the conductor of chi I chi H J inverse is P to two L or I and J. Silly. Feels like you want to do the opposite inequality, or um, I may well have written this backwards. Um, no, well, either I've got the either I've forgotten the convention for writing conductors. Okay, so this means each of these components is trivial on one plus p to the two l. Um, yeah, that, that's what I mean. Then. Here, the conductor is exactly p to the 2L. Sorry, if, if both are strict or trivial on something bigger than p to the 2L, like if chi so, and chi j are strictly bigger or, or trivial on something strictly bigger than just 1 plus p to the 2L, then how mm -hmm. could this happen? Well, I mean, one, you can't have it for two of them. I mean, this. No, but, but, then, but then, then I'm asking why is there an inequality instead of two? Because it could be for one of them. You could have one of these characters being um, trivial. You could have one of them being trivial and all the rest of them having conductor. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. okay, I get it. Okay, thank you. Um, so this this definition, well, anyway, with, with this definition, this is this completes the definition of the family that I'm going to be considering for the period bound. Um, this this Definition may look a little opaque. Um, I'll just, I will actually stop to just ask if anyone has a question about what I've written. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, I mean, the, the second part here, um, this, this condition on the kind of cross ratios is equivalent to a product L function having sort of generically large conductor, right? Um, but this sort of means that the conductor of so I take the phase change. So capital capital pi will denote the, the base change of little pi and pi h to e. Um, so this condition here means that this conductor is as large as possible. It's going to be what q to the 2n n plus 1 l. Or at least that's the factor. 
that good Q, uh, Q, P. Uh, Q, um, Q, is Q is the order of the residue field is the maximal, is the maximal idea. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this second part of the definition uh, lets us avoid conductor drop, which is always difficult when you're trying to, to prove subconvex bounds. The first part of the condition should be avoidable, but it is very convenient because it sort of lets us work integrally. Um, let's see. So these are the representations I'm going to be working with. Um, but seeing as I want to state a period bound, I need to tell you what test vectors I'm taking. Um, and so for that, I'm going to, to introduce a whole bunch more notation. Bear with me. Um, okay, so let, let's let T in GLN plus one if W, which is a local factor of W, be the diagonal subgroup. And K is going to be the usual maximal compact, <clears throat> the integral points. All right, so I'm going to take the maximal compact subgroup of this torus, just the diagonal integral things. Um, I'm going to thicken it by this much. So I'm going to thicken it by things common with the identity mod P to the L. Um, this I'm going to call C of L. So it's a thickening of this kind of compact diagonal subgroup. Um, so we've got this, for, for any representation in our family, we've got this character at W to find the principal series representation. So I'm going to take that character of T, I'm going to restrict it to this maximal compact, and then you can show that it extends to TL. So kind of restricted to TC, extends to the character type tilde of TL. Okay. So we define high type to be any pair consisting of a compact open subgroup and a character of that compact open subgroup that's KW conjugate. To this standard pair of TL and this character chi tilde. Okay, um, and so it turns out that these things are actually types in the sense of type theory. They're, they're types for the supercuspidal data you'd expect of this torus with the character chi. So, so I might be being silly again, but is that P to the 2L or P to the L up there? That, that is actually P to the 2L. That's actually P to the 2L. That's the principal Right. Yeah. But there's, there's, a, there's a thing happening where um, that the reason this is L and not 2L is because um, K to the L, I guess K P to the L, mod K P to the 2L is an helium. And so it's kind of, if I've, yeah, it's kind of easy. You get an extension of a character to this. By that, like, yeah, by that um, okay, so we've, we've got this, this set of pairs of a, you know, a, a compact subgroup, which is a thickening of a torus and a character on that. Um, the vectors, the test vectors that I'm going to be working with, uh, I'm going to call micro-localized, they, they are called micro-localized vectors. And they have the property that they transform under a subgroup like this by this character. Um, so you say 
vector in this principal series vector, principal series representation is local local J and Matilda if J five if it transforms the right way. So J phi W is lambda tilde J phi W J and J. Um, and you can show that if you if this vector is non-zero, then its type is unique. It's only a microlocal vector for one choice of these data. Okay, um, so you can define these notions for H in the same way as for G. Um, so, I, I'm going to be looking at yeah, microlocal vectors in here and in here. There's going to be a compatibility condition which ensures that the period interval I take doesn't just sort of vanish for trivial reasons. Um, and so that compatibility condition is the following. So we say that the chi type J lambda and a chi H type for H, J H lambda H compatible if, if the characters agree on the intersection of these two groups. So lambda tilde H on this intersection. And then I'll say that microlocal if vectors are compatible if their types are, because the type is uniquely determined. So that is, that is the definition we need to state our period value. So here's the theorem. So take uh, take two representations from this family. Take two vectors phi and phi h um, so I'll take these two vectors and so I'll, I'll assume they're L2 normalized. Conditions um, basically phi phi h have bounded level away from W and phi W phi H W. Micro local lifts. Okay, so those assumptions period phi against phi h, which I define just to be the integral. Bar here. And 
process over the delta quotient of H it satisfies the following bounds. So the H of phi phi H bar is at most the order of the residue field at W to the power of N over two minus delta L um, for some delta depending on N and theta. So phi and phi H, they are related to make sure that you put these test vectors so that you don't get zero, but otherwise they seem to be allowed to move. I got they, they, their levels are somehow related as well. So they, they're not allowed to move independently. In other words, if I were trying to prove a L function, let me wait until you make your L function statement because that allows me to normalize things. This is harder for me to normalize. So this is a statement for any fine by H satisfying what you have so far. Um, and I assume without the delta, it's it's easy. Yep. So without without the delta, um, this is much easier to prove. Um, you don't need you don't need phi and phi H to be Hecker eigenfunctions. You don't need them to be in kind of irreducible morphic representations here. So so without the delta, this this is the trivial bound. And it lines up and it corresponds to the convexity bound for the L functions uh, by Ochino and Cato. Um, if, if theta is fixed, I expect to get delta about one over n squared. Uh, so that's the dependence on it. All right, so any other questions before I talk about the subconvex value derived from that? Okay, so to state the subconvex bound that's derived from that, I need to add one or maybe two more conditions to my family. Um, so if two subfamily with one. Satisfying. Well, again, this is something I should, something I might possibly should have said before, um, or that follows trivially, but sorry, it just it follows from the, the other assumption that I put on pi and pi h tempered, and a fifth condition. Um, pi and pi h. Locally distinguished in all places, which means that there's a non zero home from the space of homes is non zero, so it's conjugation. Okay, so for that. Smaller family, we have the following theorem. So let's take a representation of that family. Um, so we have our path. I H check is the most conductor the quarter minus delta, whereas before these are the quadratic base change L functions to GLE. Um, and expect uh, 
else to do but one little range before, but I haven't checked this carefully yet. So now let me ask my question, since it does seem to be a rank in cell of two L functions where both seem to be varying rather than one fixed and one varying. Mm -hmm. You see my question, so I'm just trying to understand, say we're in GL2. What's your simplest example? Um, the simplest example would be yeah, GL, I mean, GL2, GL2. You got two with a yeah with a character coming from a unitary group yeah yep and then you would what have pi times chi what would this be uh yes so this would be this would be pi times pi times chi and both are allowed to move at the level freely or or they both have the same some related level that's the point so it's some kind of hybrid yes okay although if if you're on um if you're on gl2 then similar to from on gl2 i think you can let this be fixed. Yeah, right. There, there are various variants of subconvexity where you there's hybrid versions. I mean, you can you can let this be fixed without the conductor dropping that. So oh I see in your argument too. Yeah actually oh yeah sorry I'm actually maybe ignore that. I'm getting I'm getting mixed up with the Archimedean case a little bit. There's this there's the switch in the Archimedean case. But yeah so it's it's a hybrid it's a hybrid thing. Fair enough. So they have to be related through your types. Yep. What do you mean that your two cross your workers, you can take pi h to be trivial and uh, um, think pi to be induced by one chi and chi h by chi, chi h, uh, pi h is chi bar, uh, sorry, chi two. Then I consider the twisted function as your new capital pi. Chi h is trivial. In that case, you don't have this. Uh, Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wait. So I just I didn't well, consider all well, the uh, components. So there are cal one, so cal n plus one could be trivial. Yes. Yes. There's not. There's nothing that rules out one of these components being trivial. Then in the in the GL two case, you take one of them to be trivial. Yes, that is going to. Yeah. No, that that will work in that case. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's see. So, any other questions about that statement? Okay. Um, so, let me just say a little bit about what the what the conditions do. So, um, of course, the fifth condition is just to ensure that the period doesn't trivially vanish. So then you just get zero equals zero in your um, period formula. Um, the the temperedness condition is needed for the Achino Akeda, um, for, you know, for the, the proof of Achino Akeda, um, which even for the state, yeah, it's, it's, it's needed to just ensure that, that Achino Akeda holds. Um, the, the method used here should work on um, special orthogonal groups as well, the other kind of gangrose prasad um, pair. Um, and it, it should also work for more general families of representations than I've considered here. This is just a, a family which is kind of really nice to, you know, things things work out quite nicely. Um, for this family, um, I think the, the main sort of general obstacle is conductor drop. Um, that's that's something I absolutely have to avoid, but um, it should work for the method should work for more general families than this. Um, so as an example, Nelson um, adapted these ideas in the eigenvalue, the Archimedean aspect, um, and sort of combined this with his work with uh, Venkatesh on sort of semi-classical analysis of representations. Um, so Nelson also has a theorem like this for unitary groups in the eigenvalue aspect, and also for GLN in the eigenvalue and the T aspect. Um, okay, so having stated that, um, so I'll say, I'll, I'll sort of give you some background about um, well, sort of how I, how I arrived at these two results. Um, so starting from some, some remarks about yeah, the relation between periods, L functions, and sort of general harmonic analysis on manifolds. Um, and 
I, I mostly think about these things in the context of mass forms, because you know I, I also kind of work with just eigenfunctions on manifolds. Um, so until further notice, all of the automorphic forms I talk about are going to be mass forms. So, you know, a, a very classic example of the link between these three things is just the Hecker period on GL2, right? So you have your, your integral, you, know, you, you write your L function as the integral of your mass form over this, you know, vertical geodesic uh, against a character. Um, and you know, this is something that analysts have studied just on a general manifold. You know, take a geodesic, integrate your eigenfunction over that geodesic against the character. You know, there are kind of general bounds for this that, that are kind of independent of anything arithmetic. So the example that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more depth first is point evaluation or suit norm on a hyperbolic surface. I really need to get some beam, like some slides written for this because it does always end like stating this always ends up taking like 10 minutes long that I uh, two minutes longer than I plan on. Um, okay, so let's take the modular surface and I'll take psi the Hickemass cusp form uh, L2 normalized and Spectral parameters and okay. So there is a period formula due to Voltage that relates the value of psi at the CM point I to some central algebra. some other constants, but they're sort of explicit and uh, behaving mildly as, as lambda goes to infinity. So each of these L functions has conductor lambda squared. And so that means the convexity bound for each of them is lambda to the half. So I get lambda to the half plus epsilon. So I get lambda to the one plus epsilon in the numerator, and then L of one add psi is lambda to the little o of one. Um, and so the convexity bound gives us this bound for um, psi i squared, or if I just I take a square root, I get psi as most lambda to the half plus epsilon. So this bound is this bound is known on a general compact surface. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a bound on a general compact manifold of any dimension. It's due to a Vakamovich and Leviton. We have a manifold M, which is compact. N dimensional, and I have an eigenfunction of frequency lambda. In its suit norm, is it most lambda to the N minus one over two. And this also holds on 
a non-compact thing if you look at fixed compact sets and kind of locally you know, L2 normalized Reigen function, um, which so this is L2 normalized, I'll write that up. Um, okay, so, you know, if you like, you can take this bound that holds in a general manifold and plug it into this and you, you recover the convexity bound for your central algorithms from this kind of purely harmonic analysis approach. Um, it's also conjectured, so you have Lindelof for the central L values, that would imply that psi of i is lambda to the epsilon, um, but this is also conjectured on a general, say if you um, take a general compact uh, surface, it's conjectured that the supernorm grows like lambda to the epsilon, and the same is conjectured on the hyperbolic surface if you look at a fixed compact set. Um, you know, this is sort of follows from the general philosophy of quantum chaos that eigenfunctions and negative curvature should be should be behaving chaotically. Um, although this this only holds on surfaces that you expect lambda to the epsilon growth in higher dimension, it's known to be false. Um, Okay, so we, we have this connection between bounds for eigenfunctions and bounds for L values. Um, now, it's known that the, the central L value satisfies subconvex bound, so that would give you a saving for this value of the eigenfunction. Um, and you can ask, well, can you go the other way? Is there some bound you can prove for this, kind of using harmonic analysis? But you can pass back and get a subconvex bound here. And the answer is yes, but only if you kind of use the fact that psi is a Hecker eigenfunction. If you just give me a Laplace eigenfunction on a negatively curved surface, um, we, we only know how to improve this trivial upper bound by square root log lambda. That's a theorem of Barad. Um, so, so just using harmonic analysis alone, you can't prove a bound for this that gives you kind of subconvexity. But Avanitz and Sarnak used the Hecker, op Hecker operators to give a bound for this that improves this by a power and therefore does give you a subconvex bound. So state that. Uh, where are they? Yeah. So they improve, they improve of the trivial up bound for the soup norm uh, of lambda to the half to lambda to the 5 twelfths plus epsilon uh, using a technique called arithmetic amplification. And if you combine that with this, you get a subconvex bound. Okay, so this, this is something that works for GL2. So natural question is, does this generalize to higher rank? How would you, how would you generalize this picture? Um, so a natural thing to try might be to say, okay, well, this was a you know, point evaluation, a soup norm on a hyperbolic surface. What about on hyperbolic n manifold? Um, So let's try taking G to be SON1 and then H to be the maximum compact subgroup SON. Because here we're, we're really not evaluating at a point, we're really integrating over SO2, the maximal compact subgroup. Um, and for this pair of groups, well, this is um, 
a gangrose preside pair, so we have a chino cater. Um, but if we just, yeah, so let me just finish introducing the notation. So I want to take the psi take the mass form on G and then this period. So I want to integrate psi over H, which is just the same as evaluating it at some sort of arithmetic point. Um, but things, as soon as N is three or bigger, things start working in a very different way. Um, so first of all, you're integrating over H against the trivial representation. Um, the Chino Akeda doesn't allow that. It has to be something tempered. Um, so the period formula you might think to use kind of goes out the window. Um, but also, these periods generically vanish. So when I say most psi, more accurately, um, unless psi is a theta left. SL2. Um, this is this is you know, a distinction principle. And it's only it's only through special forms which can have a non-zero period over this over the subject. Um, so this is quite different from the situation in on the modular surface where I'm sure this this value is going to vanish for odd mass forms, but for even ones we'd expect it to be generically non-zero. Okay, so this just point evaluation or integration over the maximal compact um, turns out not to generalize very well. You, you really do need to put, um, you know, a, a tempered generic thing on your, um, the, both, both factors in your gangroche prasad pair. So, okay, if I, if I want to keep working with mass forms and if I want to keep working on hyperbolic space, just because it's a kind of simple geometric example, um, well, I'm going to need to change the signature of this. So instead, let's try H is SON minus 1, 1. So, so I'll still let Psi be a Hecker mass form on G. And I'll say the spectral parameter Psi is going to be lambda, and then on H, so H is now you know, given me a copy of hyperbolic n minus one space inside my hyperbolic n manifold. So psi H is going to be a Hecker mass form on H. And I'll call the spectral parameter of that lambda H. Um, and so the period I want, again, I have this period pH of psi and psi H, which is just restrict this mass form to my hyperbolic n minus one dimensional submanifold and integrate. Okay, so things here work much better um, if both, if the representations containing these are both tempered, you can apply a Chino Ikeda. Um, and then there are situations where, you know, if you apply a Chino Ikeda and write the norm squared of this as the central L value of the product L function, the sort of trivial bound for this you get from harmonic analysis lines up with the convexity bound for the L function. Um, it lines up in a certain range. So the, the assumption we have to put on the two spectral parameters is if
lambda h lies in this range for some fixed delta positive, then the trivial boundless period coming from harmonic analysis reads with convexity for the product L function. happens when you're trying to kind of just touch convexity um, the criterion here is that you know there's there's some family of automorphic forms that you're putting these two in um, and the size of that family has to be the conductor of the cell function to the quarter um, the relevant family that you're putting that you're putting these two in is the family of automorphic forms where this is fixed and this is in a spectral window. You're looking at forms in a spectral window with one around lambda. And so you only need to sort of complete the, the form on G, not on H. Okay. So let's see. So this is a situation where you know, the, the trivial bound for the period lines up, lines up with the convexity bound. Um, so what you'd like to do then is sort of extend the theorem of Ivanovich at Sarnak and improve this period bound using amplification. So, unless I can go to I can go to five thirty. Okay, very good. Um, So I'll, I'll quickly remember, I'll quickly recall um, how Barnett Sarnak's amplification method works. So you start with, so let's let's kind of go back to the setting of the modular surface. Um, so what they do is they start with a pre-trace formula. So you have a test function little k, so this is a function on SL2R that's left and right invariant under SO2. Um, you plug this into the pre-trace formula, and so you get something like this. So on the left-hand side, you have the eigenfunctions weighted by this test function k hat. And on the right-hand side, you've got some geometric expression. Um, and so if you, if you do some kind of standard things with this, you get back the, the trivial bound of the over at the time. Um, so what amplification does is applies a Hecker operator to this and say the x variable. Um, so T is a Hecker operator of let T hat psi i be the eigenvalue of T on my i get the mass form. So now Instead of a pretrace formula, you've got an amplified pretrace formula.
Okay, so on the spectral side, and so then you, you can set x equal to y. So this is just giving you the norm squared of the mass forms uh, that you're summing over. So on the spectral side, we've, we've got our distinguished mass form psi that we're trying to give a, an improved bound for. So we pick our Hecker operator so that its eigenvalue on psi is large. We kind of choose T to kind of resonate with psi in some sense. Um, so that, that makes psi appear with a large coefficient. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got the sum over all the Hecker, you know, we, we have all the kind of Hecker translates that are making up a Hecker operator. Um, and for each translate, we've got this test function evaluated at this point, which is sort of asking, so tell you how much your Hecker translate moves X, the point where you're evaluating your mass form. Um, and one of the ingredients in controlling this geometric side is, you know, the fact that this test function K decays away from the origin. Um, that's sort of, Part of, part of how you set this all up. Um, but that's the kind of Archimedean ingredient in controlling this geometric site, simply that, that K decays away from the maximal compact SO2. So you can, you can try and apply all of this in this higher dimensional setting where we're taking you know, periods of mass forms. Um, the problem is that the off diagonal terms suddenly become much more complicated and sort of inexplicit. But right, here we were, I mean, this is this is not completely explicit, but we have good asymptotic control over this test function, um, in particular on how it how it decays. The corresponding things you have to deal with when you're trying to amplify this period are the following. So I have two copies of H, um, and just to, just to clear, I'm working at I'm working at infinity. This is an Archimedean integral. Um, so I have my eigenfunction my eigenfunction on my hyperbolic subspace. Um, I have two copies of that integrated against this kernel, which is a similar kind of thing as I was, I was taking here. Um, it's maybe best to draw a picture of this. So gamma is, gamma is again some kind of rational element showing up in my Hecker operator. Um, so in, say in the case where n equals um, n equals three, drawing a picture of this would, would look as follows. So I've got this ambient hyperbolic three manifold. I have a hyperbolic plane inside there. Um, I've got you know, an eigenfunction psi h on that hyperbolic surface. I've got a translate of that. This is h2, this is gamma applied to h2, and I've got a translate I've, I've translated psi, picked it up and moved it over to here. Um, and then this is, you can really think of this as an integral kernel. Um, you know, I have a point pair invariant kernel, um, k of x gamma y. Um, and I use that to kind of, well, I, I make an integral operator that moves this eigenfunction over to here, and then I pair. This is sort of like in a product like this. Um, so I'm almost out of time, so I'll just quickly kind of say, yeah, say some concluding, concluding words. Um, this is quite hard because this is now an eigenfunction on a surface and you don't have very good control over it, um, you know, as opposed to in, in the case where n equals two, you're looking at sort of geodesics and psi h is just a character, it's, it's all very explicit. Um, you know, I was able to kind of 
work something out like that in the previous paper. Once you go up to two dimension, once you go up to n equals three, um, it, it's, it's much harder to kind of control this off diagonal to in your amplified relative trace formula. Um, so to, to kind of cut a long story short, the, the way you approach this, I mean, there was a way that I was planning to approach this, which involved kind of microlocal analysis. You kind of understand how this thing is microlocally concentrated or should be in the unit tangent bundle of this H2. And then if you kind of show that, well, the place where this is microlocally concentrated is not is sort of transverse or disjoint from where this is concentrated, you should get some saving in this integral. Um, now, I was not able to implement that, but there was, a, there was a workaround that you can do, which is instead of taking spherical vectors, instead of taking these as mass forms, you take something called microlocalized vectors. Um, and what that does is, is this kind of geometric optics argument where you know, this, this thing is concentrated somewhere in phase space, this thing is concentrated somewhere in phase space. It makes that much easier. Um, you, you actually get a, you know, there, there's something which is actually concentrated spatially somewhere, and you can do this transversality. Um, Sorry, and what you just said, spatially and, and microlocally is in the QM, is in this um, place W. Yes, so, so the actual theorem I ended up proving was doing, you know, I, I realized that, oh, we can just do all of this at this finite place W. And it's much easier to come write down the microlocalized vectors and do all of this analysis. Um, yeah, so I, well, I guess I better stop there. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? So am I right in understanding that the, the point of these conditions you wrote down over here on, on these on these types, the compatibility is to get this trace formula to simplify and or see the, the term where y equals x better? Or? Yeah, it's the, the compatibility is to make sure the period doesn't trivially vanish. Uh, but the, the whole general setup with, with the kind of micro-localized vectors transforming under these maximal compact subgroups is, yeah, it, it gives you an easy way of controlling this off diagonal. So then could you could could you have a, a different kind of setup where instead of you know maybe a principal series you have like a supercuspidal on H and then something induced from that supercuspidal on, on G. And then maybe you have some type on G that restricts to the correct type on H. So yeah, there, there should be there should be an analog of this for kind of other other families of representations. Okay. And again, yeah, so I think I think involving the type again, it's, it's yeah. If you thought of any other kinds of types or, or just, just this, this. Just this. Subject. So the genericity of the character um, comes up in this transversality at the last step. Uh, let's see. Yes, it's, so I should, I should add, yeah, the, the, I've got, I had these kind of two, there's the kind of individual generosity of the characters. So that doesn't appear in Nelson's work. Um, and I, I, and that, well, I'd hope that it can be removed here. Um, if you if you remove that first kind of individual generosity, um, you can make thing you can make the, the two micro localized vectors line up in the right way, I imagine. But you have to conjugate by something non-integral. Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's the second type of of um, generosity that yeah, means you can just get a nice transversality. I'm um, sorry, Yura. Uh, did this strategy work for general UN plus UN? Uh, let's see, that I don't know. I don't know. But A is not equal to M. I mean, I guess you'd have to. I could do the parameter hmm. formula on the bigger un unitary group. I mean, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not entirely familiar with what the period formula is. You've got to sort of thicken the, the smaller unitary group in that case, right? And I, I'm, not, I'm not quite familiar with how that works. 
So you also mentioned that there was some some other work that you've done where you didn't assume that these were definite. Oh, the the conditions of infinity are um, really not really important. Yeah, I, I originally wrote this up with there. They were mass forms of bounded eigenvalue, um, but it's it's all kind of the same. There's there's really nothing serious going on. Any other questions? No, let's thank Simon again.